Now you know how to perform complex uh, Morley wavelet convolution. But what we haven't learned yet is how exactly to extract power and phase information from the result of complex Morley wavelet convolution. And of course, the power and the phase values are really the critical pieces of information. This is why we perform the uh, wavelet convolution in the first place. So this is what I'm going to tell you about in this lecture. Uh, a lot of the material in this lecture will be a review and extension of the material in the lecture on um, extracting power and phase values from uh, from the Fourier coefficients, from the complex Fourier, uh, Fourier coefficients. So if you saw, if you didn't see that lecture or you saw it a really long time ago uh, and you feel like you might need a refresher, it would be good to watch that lecture before going back to this one. So. Again, that was the one on uh, extracting um, power and phase from the complex Fourier coefficients. Okie dokie. So just uh, by way of quick reminder, we get um, three, or there are three characteristics, uh, three features of oscillations. We have the frequency, how fast they cycle, uh, the phase, that is the, uh, or the phase angle time series, I should say, that is the position along the sine wave and the power or the strength of the oscillation um, as uh, measured by the analytic uh, envelope and uh, you can picture as being like a blanket that we lay on top of these fluctuations. Um, so frequency of course we get uh, or is we, we get from the frequency of the sine wave that we use to create the Morley wavelet and now we're going to talk about how to extract the phase angle time series and the power. So just to show this information another way, here we have a filtered EEG time series. Here is the um, oscillation amplitude, and we would square this yellow line to get the power. And here are the phase. Here is the phase angle time series. Um, and of course, you know this is really um, spiraling around on a polar plot, and it it looks like it's discretized here. That's just when it goes from um, uh, two pi to zero. Okay, so you know that when we perform wavelet convolution, we're actually using a complex Morley wavelet. That means the wavelet has both a real part and an imaginary part. And so that means that when we compute the dot product between the complex Morley wavelet and the EEG data as one step in time domain convolution, the resulting dot product is a single number, but it's a single complex number, so it has two uh, components. It has a real component and an imaginary component. This is very similar to how in the Fourier transform, at each step of the Fourier transform, uh, the dot product between the EEG time series and the um, complex sine wave is a dot product that contains two parts, the real part and the imaginary part. Okay, and so Morley wavelets live a double life. They have uh, um, uh, an extension in the, um, the, uh, the, the real world and an extension in the imaginary world. Um, so they have a real part and an imaginary part. This of course comes from the way we construct the sine waves used to create the Morley wavelet um, where we say e to the i and this is the square root of minus one um, k where k is 2 pi ft or the formulation for a sine wave. And so again this is just to remind you that this complex sine wave is something we see uh, in the Morley wavelet and it's something we see in the discrete time Fourier transform um, at each step when looping over frequencies. Okay, so this is a bit of a reminder from that previous lecture. We know that the square root of a minus one is undefined, it doesn't really exist. Arguably it's not a quantity that actually exists in the universe. It's just a construction that mathematicians have come up with in order to conveniently solve uh, a bunch of mathematics problems that would be really annoying and, and difficult to solve if we weren't, if we didn't have access to um, a quantity like this. So when we have this imaginary operator, which is the square root of minus one, then this gives us something called a complex number. And a complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. And this was the example I gave in the previous lecture where here is the complex number one and two i. And uh, this is not the sum of two numbers. 
It's not like this is a variable, like one plus two x. This is actually a single number, but it has these two parts. Okay, and then one of the powerful, one of the things that makes this uh, complex numbers so powerful is that we can represent them on a two-dimensional plane. So here is a Cartesian plane, and instead of an x and a y axis, we have a real and an imaginary axis. So this complex number we can represent as a location, as a point in this plane. So one on the real axis and two on the imaginary axis. And we can push this a step further and think about this uh, coordinate, this point, as being the endpoint of a line, a vector that goes from the origin to that point. And uh, now once we get to this step, we can extract the length of this line, the magnitude m of this line, and the angle of the line relative to the positive real axis. And in the lecture on Fourier coefficients, we discussed that uh, the length of this line is power. So when this dot is the Fourier coefficient, the result of taking the dot product between a complex sine wave and the EG data, um, this line gives us the amplitude. Actually, I think I just said power, but this is the amplitude and we square this to get power. And this angle is the phase angle. And so what we're going to see in this video is that extending this concept to um, to complex uh, Morley wavelet convolution, what we have is essentially the same thing. Um, the only difference is that now we are adding a time dimension. And so rather than just having one single complex number for an entire frequency, we're going to have a single complex number for every frequency, but also every time point. So this is actually just the dot product of the um, of the more complex Morley wavelet and the EEG data, uh, or part of the EEG data, at one time point. The next time point, this dot's going to move slightly, and we get a different vector. And now we extract power and phase in the same way. Okay, so now we do um, each step of wavelet convolution in the time domain. Um, of course, in practice, you do you still do all this stuff in the frequency domain as multiplication in the frequency domain. Uh, but I think it's it's easier to, um, or at least easier for me to conceptualize how this works in time domain convolution. So each of these dot products, uh, I'm sorry, this should say dot product, not commonality. That's a bit old. Um, each of these dot products is actually representable in a two-dimensional uh, complex space. Okay, so this is more a uh, review from that other lecture. Uh, I went through this in a bit more detail before, but basically the idea is that using some simple uh, arithmetic and simple geometry and simple trigonometry, we can coordinate, uh, we can go back and forth between uh, rectangular notation where we represent a complex number like this. So here's the real part and the imaginary part. And this polar notation where we can think about this complex number in terms of cosine components and sine components. Um, and of course, a magnitude, which would be the distance away from zero. This led us to uh, learning about uh, Euler's formula. And this is Euler's formula, e to the i k equals cosine k plus i sine k. And if you remember, Euler's formula was really just a very convenient way for us to store and represent information about um, oscillations and complex numbers in order to very easily extract um, uh, what we need out of those uh, numbers, which is power and phase. Okay, so this is also uh, a bit of a review. So now we see that this uh, point, this complex number, can be represented as cosine k plus i sine k, or it can also be represented as e to the i k. Um, this is on a unit circle, so this is a unit vector. So implicitly there is a one here, this vector, were not uh, exactly one, if it were smaller than one or greater than one, we would have m e to the i k equals m cosine k plus i sine k. And now the main difference, as I mentioned, between uh, what we're doing here with wavelet convolution and what we did previously with the Fourier uh, transform is that now we have one of these vectors, one of these dot products, every single time point, and it's going to loop around this circle. Okay.
And so now the result of complex Morley wavelet convolution is a time series of dot products, but now this is a time series of complex dot products. And from each dot product at each time point, we can extract the magnitude and the phase angle. And now we can also extract the projection onto the real axis. So now there are three pieces of information that we can extract from the result of complex Morley wavelet convolution. So we get the magnitude of this line, which is the amplitude, and then we can square the length of this line to get power. We can get this uh, angle, that, so the angle of the vector relative to the positive real axis. This gives us our phase angle time series. And we can extract the projection of this uh, dot product onto the real axis, so ignoring the imaginary axis. Uh, and that's gonna give us the um, the, the bandpass filtered signal at the um, with bandpass at the frequency characteristics corresponding to the frequency characteristics of the wavelet. Okay, so now this is just another way of illustrating the same concept. It's an important concept, so I will illustrate it um, in several different pictures. So here we have our EEG data. Here we have our uh, complex Morley wavelet. And when we perform convolution, we get at each step of convolution. It's a single uh, complex dot product. So that looks something like this. This would be the dot product from, from one point in time. So from just from here. From this uh, dot product, this complex dot product, we can extract the projection of the dot product onto the real axis, which is actually just the real part of, the, uh, of this uh, complex dot product. And this is our bandpass filtered signal. This is equivalent to, or very, very similar to, just having a normal FIR bandpass filter and applying that filter to the data. The second thing we can extract is the length of the line, so the distance from the origin to that dot product. And then we can square this length, and then we get time frequency power. And this is our estimate of time frequency power at the frequency corresponding to the frequency of the wavelet. And at the time point corresponding to the center of the wavelet relative to its position in the EEG data. Okay, and then of course the idea is that we want to populate this entire space. Um, and the third piece of information we get is uh, the angle of this vector relative to the positive real axis. And this is our um, uh, uh, phase angle time series. Okay, I think I, I won't uh, do it in so much detail on this thing. This is exactly the same as the previous two slides just shown in yet another way. It's really an important concept, so um, I think it's useful to see it illustrated in several different ways. Real EEG data, or raw EEG data. Here's our uh, wavelet. I'm only drawing the, uh, the real part of the wavelet here, but of course this is a complex wavelet. Um, and from the results of of convolution between this complex Morley wavelet and the data, we get a time series of dot products here in complex space from which we extract the projection onto the real axis, uh, that's the bandpass filtered signal, the length of this line, and then we can square it and that gives us the power time series, and the angle relative to the positive real axis, and that gives us our phase angle time series. Now, at this step, um, I often get the question, do we really need a, um, a complex wavelet? And can't we get some of this information from just using a normal real valued wavelet? The answer is it depends on what you want to get out of the signal. And if all you care about is the bandpass filtered signal, then you do not need to have a complex wavelet. You can just have a real valued wavelet and that's fine. You will get the real part of the wavelet. What you need the complex wavelet for is to um, is to obtain the projection of this um, of the result onto the imaginary axis. Without having that co that sine component, the imaginary component, you don't get the projection onto the imaginary axis. And without having this projection, you have no height in this um, uh, data point, and so you cannot extract power uh, or phase. And here's the reason. If we have such and such projection onto the real axis, so we say that 
this point projects to here on the real axis without knowing the projection onto the imaginary axis we don't know what the power and the phase is because the projection onto the real axis here that means this dot the complex uh, dot product it could be here or here or here or all the way up here the projection on the real axis is the same so the real part would be the same so the question is what is the power here and what is the phase and to get that to get these two pieces of information we need the imaginary axis and to get the imaginary axis we need a complex Morley wavelet all right now let's switch to MATLAB and see how this looks. This script starts off very similar to script from uh, a previous lecture, maybe it was even the previous lecture. So here we load in data, um, we pick a channel and a trial, this is just kind of picking randomly. And here I'm just uh, defining this variable data to be um, all of this stuff. And this is, so this is the EEG data from this channel, all time points and this trial. And this is just for convenience, so we, we don't have to keep rewriting this everywhere else in the script. All right, here we create our wavelet. Here we define the parameters for, um, for the convolution. Here we actually perform the convolution. I'm not going to go through these step by step because you've already seen all of this in uh, previous lectures. All right, so here is where we are going to start plotting some results of convolution um, in hopes of understanding what these results mean a little bit more. So here you see this kind of really neat looking, uh, it's almost like, um, I don't know, it looks like a, the outline of a vase, a vase or something. Um, but this is the result of convolution in its full three-dimensional complex representation. So here we have the time axis, the real axis, and the imaginary axis. Now it's interesting to take this and zoom it around and if you would um, uh, move it around such that you're projecting through the imaginary axis, now you have only the time axis and the real axis, then you would see this is the bandpass filtered signal. This looks like a bandpass filtered signal. Um, technically we could also project through the real axis and get just the imaginary axis which is uh, a defined quantity, but generally we don't really ever do anything with this. Um, and then we can also project through the time axis and see just the um, real axis and the imaginary axis. Now this looks more like what you saw with the um, three-dimensional uh, representation of the complex Morley wavelet as well as the complex sine wave. Now with the complex sine wave, you'll remember it was just going around at constant amplitude. With the complex Morley wavelet, it was going, uh, sort of started very small and then cycled out and then cycled back in and it finished very small. So now we see that this signal is changing in amplitude, which means it's changing in its distance away from the origin over time. All right, so now let's look at this representation. So now here in figure one, we went from representing this uh, this wave in um, uh, in the real part and the imaginary part and now what we're going to do is combine these two dimensions the real part and the imaginary part in order to get power and phase and you can see how I do that here uh, on line 65 so I plot the magnitude which is the through the function abs as well as uh, the angle which is the MATLAB function angle all right, so now this is where things start getting interesting. So now we can project through the phase dimension, and now we can see this is the power time series. Well, okay, the, amp the analytic uh, envelope uh, time series. We could square this to get the power time series. And we could look at this a different way and get the phase angle time series over time. So that's pretty neat. We see the phase and the power information in the same um, three-dimensional structure. And here I've been plotted uh, slightly, <laughs> a little bit less uh, interesting to look at, but it's also very informative. So here's the bandpass filtered signal on the top. This is the, um, let's see, where is this? This is line 75. This is the projection onto the real axis. This is the um, power time series. So you can see we're extracting the magnitude of the line and then squaring it. So this is the power time series. And then we have the phase angle time series over here, which we extract on line 91 as the angles. All right, 
So to help you visualize this a little bit better, uh, we're going to make uh, another plot here. And what we're going to plot in figure four, it's going to be a bit of a movie. We're going to see on the top, there's going to be a polar plot um, where you see uh, something like this, but evolving over time. So you'll see the lines, not all of time plotted at once, but you'll see time in segments. So it'll be like this snake kind of moving around. And at the same time, you're going to see the power time series, which looks like this. And you'll see the relationship between uh, this complex representation of the of the result of Morley wavelet convolution and the power that we're going to extract. All right, here goes. So here you see the signal in its uh, complex representation. Um, and now what I would like you to notice is that as this line gets further away from the origin, further away from zero, the power is going up. And now you can see the power is going down. And now this snake is uh, getting closer and closer to zero. And now it's going back further away from zero again because it's going up. The second thing I would like you to notice is that what's happening here in the power is totally um, uh, uncoupled with what's happening here in the phase. And what I mean by that is that um, as this thing is spiraling around, this thing is not spiraling around the way this is. So this is actually moving very slowly and this power time series has nothing to do with the phase angles here. So the position of this point along this um, polar plane, it only has to do with the distance from the point at each time point to the origin, to zero. Um, so this you could contrast with the uh, with the um, the bandpass filtered signal or the projection onto the real axis. And so what I encourage you to do, if you would like a little bit of a challenge, is to fix this code or adjust this code a little bit, so that instead of plotting the power time series here, you are plotting the projection onto the real axis. So that will um, involve um, yeah, changing what's being drawn here and also changing the y-axis limits. And you don't need to change the polar plot. And there what you will see is the projection onto the real axis follows both the amplitude or the distance away from the origin and the phase angle relative to, uh, relative to zero. So uh, let me see. Oh yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to mention is that if this is running, so the speed with which this movie uh, um, updates depends on your computer speed and most importantly your your graphic card. If you find that it's going frustratingly slow you can change this skipping variable in the middle like to 10 for example now we're skipping over 10 time points. Um, yeah I find this to be a little too fast on my computer but you know just so you know you can play around with this number a bit. Okay well I hope you found this lecture um, insightful to how we extract power and phase information from the result of uh, complex Morley wavelet convolution. This is really an important bottleneck, and now that you understand this, we can really start moving forward and, uh, and doing much more interesting things with, uh, with time frequency analyses.